looks like Oliver is did he freeze out? Internet, which is uh -oh. fine. he'll come back. We're all good. We got backups. So I'm Mr. Kevin. Hi everyone. <laughs> So today's topic is uh, the recovery of bicycles. So if you've watched our previous streams, uh, we've talked about bike locks, we've talked about how to lock your bike, we've talked about uh, bike index specifically, uh, but there's some other sort of things that go into what happens when a bike is stolen, because it's a real thing. Bikes do get stolen. It happens. Um, so uh, why don't you talk a little bit about your background, uh, where you came from, um, and uh, you know why it is that we invited you here today? Yeah. Um, thanks, Kevin. Um, so yeah, like Oliver stated, my name is Adam Yonke. Um, I am currently the Associated Students um, Bicycle Shop Coordinator up at UCSB. Um, although I am originally from San Diego and I'm currently in San Diego, um, in San Diego County out of Ramona, um, visiting my folks. But um, yeah, so my time is spent largely at UCSB kind of running this DIY um, share uh, community space um, for students. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, if anyone is familiar with the Santa Barbara area, you'd know how prevalent cycling is uh, within the community. Um, but then if you've ever visited UCSB and the adjacent uh, community of Isla Vista, you'd also see just how kind of crazy seasonal um, bicycle traffic is throughout um, that community. Um, at our current status, UCSB has a, a platinum status, or it has the like platinum designation from the League of American Cycles regarding um, bike friendly, um, you know, infrastructure. Um, and a, my shop is a part of that. So it's like my shop. It's also bike education. It's also bike infrastructure, including paths and um, spaces to walk bikes. So um, I would say that our UCSB is maybe the most active cycling campus in the United States, and I would then therefore say that UC Davis is maybe our main competitor as um, a major cycling friendly hub. So um, the there's a little difference geographically, though, speaking is that UC Davis is a little bit more of a college within a that it is intermingled with the town that is Davis, which isn't necessarily like explicitly like maybe a college village. Um, with a very specific age, with a much wider age demographic group. Um, but within uh, Isla Vista, it's, it's very apparent when school is in session that you're, you're, you're looking at everyone is, most folks are between 18 to 24 years old. Um, they're there for 10 weeks um, in the fall, the winter and the spring, and then the summer comes around and it's just like, it's almost like a ghost town. So um, yeah, with that being said, that's my background um within cycling but as our, our oliver mentioned as well i'm also a practicing artist and for the last three years i've also been teaching as a faculty member at the ucsb within the ucsb art department um, my practice is mainly photography um, but uh, some of my work um, and a lot of my work's trajectory is veering more towards social practice and um, the utilization of photography as a means to an end, not necessarily like as the object itself, um, as a lot of my work is. So, um, but anyways, yeah, that's kind of my background. And uh, yeah, I'll shoot it back to Oliver. Yeah. Great, awesome. Yeah, I had some connection issues there. Um, so yeah, so like I was mentioning, we're gonna talk about um, you know, what happens to bikes when they're stolen. So I guess the first question to lead off with is, you know, if you've ever had a bike stolen, yeah. So, for, yeah. <laughs> well, not awesome, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I've personally never been the victim of a bike theft. Um, bikes, as I've been a cyclist, to be it's been some maybe somewhat of an irrational fear of mine that my bike would get stolen. Maybe not so because you know, off, uh, like bicycle reselling is maybe the most perfect gray market that I would say exists for. Um, someone to be stealing and flipping and selling. Um, that being said, I have endless, you know, experiences with friends and uh, clients and customers who have had their bikes stolen um, with varying degrees of su success with recovery. Um, some of those recovery stories involve actually confronting the alleged perpetrator, and some involve, you know, the phone call from police uh, or 
uh, that, that that mentions that they have a bike that fits your description or the confrontation of someone who had bought the bike after it was stolen and did not understand it was a stolen bike. But now you're like, or this person or a friend or acquaintance, et cetera, is now involved in this conversation with someone who is none the wiser. So um, the last bike I would say I physically recovered was for a shop I was working at. Um, where we had a, a number of um, bikes that were just on, uh, were commission sales, or not commission sales, but um, what's that called when some a private person, consignment, they were bikes on consignment in the shop. So that meant we like didn't own them. So it was really awful when they did get stolen. You know, we had to talk with the person who, you know, entrusted them to us to be like, oh, you know, we, we were caught sleeping and, you know, we had these things taken we filed a police report and really didn't figure that we'd ever get these things back um about a week later i was riding my bike just around town downtown santa barbara and i saw one of the bikes that was taken uh locked up to a rack um it, it was quite fortunate that like no kind of tooling or painting had been done to the bike to try and disguise its appearance um and i was able to kind of um to post up and I uh, contacted the authorities and the bike was recovered after the shop had, you know, the shop manager at the time had shown up and provided proof of ownership, um, proof of consignment with photographs and documentation. And the police were more than fine with letting us, you know, use the grinder, our grinder that we had to provide uh, to get the bike back. And we never even saw who, who may have locked the bike there. Um, so, it's a really, it's a depressing thing, I will say, in short, when a bike is stolen, because um, I feel like I've read this article or maybe seen it advertised a few times, but, you know, people develop seemingly, like, romantic relationships with bikes that are very just, like... I do, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I personally have somewhere between 15 to 20 bikes, you know, in, you know, rideable shape and somewhat rideable shape. And if I ever lost any one of those things to theft, I would just be like such a sad sack for <laughs> for such a disproportionate amount of time. So, um, well, I think I think too, like it it depends because for some folks, it's like their main, you know, yeah. form of transportation. For other folks, I mean, like for myself, and I know for you as well, like you know, we're both bike nerds. Like part of it is like, oh man, like this is a piece of history. Yeah. And for others, you know, it might be like this super crazy investment that they've made into yeah. like the latest cutting edge, you know, like spaceship bike. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I definitely feel that. Yeah. Um, and that's really interesting you bring that up because I think it really I, I can't think I mean, besides a vehicle or a car, I mean, even maybe not a car, but it's just like I can't think of another machine or object that a, a person could own that socially is stratified as widely as a bicycle is. It's just like everyone rides a bike, you know, for one reason or another. Everyone owns a bike for various different reasons. Um, and there really isn't a terrible amount of hurdles in your way if you're looking to, to get a bike. And so once you do get one that you really like, especially because we've all had that experience of sitting on bikes that are too small, too big, uncomfortable, it's like once you get that one that fits you and fits your purpose, there is like, I'm just going to come out and say it. There is a romantic relationship that that, ha that happens there. Um, so this kind of goes into my next question. We have a question in the comments. Um, so I was going to ask, you know, what did you uh, do to try and retrieve that bike? And, you know, you already went into that. But the question that came up was um, what documentation should people keep to prove, uh, you know, ownership of their bike? And that's actually a tricky question, uh, at least for me. I don't know. What yeah. You have so, to say about it? Yeah. So everyone, you can get. So everyone can get their bicycle registered with registered with the state, um, and you can. Um, uh, you can. Everyone can get their bicycle registered with the state and or county, um, and you get a registration code that you base that comes as like a sticker, and you can put that on your bike. It's one of those like kind of aluminum pieces. Um, any the sticker isn't like it's important but it's not terribly important because you know to go through that process of getting a registration number for your bike through the county or through the state um you are providing photographic documentation of the bike um so this so the county has proof of you know of what it looks like and you know who's the last owner etc cetera, etc cetera. 
Um, so in the event that a, and this happens a lot in my community of Santa Barbara, is that um, the op, like kind of the opposite of what I'm talking about is just like a lot of bikes um, do come up stolen. A lot of bikes are uh, disputed over by, you know, the person who now owns it versus the person who did own it. And then when the, the police inevitably get involved, if that bike is not in the county's registration record, um, the police basically confiscate that bike until the case is litigated. Now, to think about, you know, <laughs> someone wanting to go through all those steps to um, fight to get their bike back from the state at this point or from the county at this point, you're, it, it, it's oftentimes it just turns into abandoned property. Like no one really goes that far unless you're looking at, you know, there are certain bikes that people certainly would try to go to the mat over. Um, but the general quality and expensive bikes that are, I'm talking about that are in dispute are, you know, they cost maybe $150 from the start. So it's like, you know, it becomes like, is, is my time worth it to get this thing back? So that documentation piece that Jacob is uh, talking about um, can be provided, like I said, through your county and getting a bike registration number. Yeah, I was going to jump in and say, you know, I think something that's really helpful too. Um, shameless plug is uh, bikeindex.org. Um, they're mm -hmm. awesome. Um, you know, you can put in a bunch of information about your bike, your serial number. We talked about it last time in our live stream, and it's really great for you know making sure that there's a record of you having this bike. Um, you know, you can input even like if you have certain standout components on your bike, you can mention that there too, um, so that in the event that you know someone finds your bike and it still has those components that are super awesome that you've invested into, like that's another way for, you know, for people to identify that that's your bike. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to that story that you're telling about, you know, that bike that got stolen, um, you know, what do you wish you had done before that bike got stolen? Or, you know, what type of advice would you give to others, um, you know, to try and prevent that from happening? Yeah, so this now that I think about it, this same situation has happened twice in my experience working at bicycles, actually three times working at bicycle shops. Um, and the one time I did was able to recover the bike uh, is, is I'm like one for three at this point. Um, but in in two of the cases, the shops that I was at basically had the bikes like out on display. Um, and I think they had a cable lock strung through them. And um, I can't remember the exact way the cable lock was oriented, but it most likely was a staff member who just like wasn't paying attention and just kind of made it look like the cable was situated in a way. And someone just was able to be a person to, to take the take advantage of the opportunity and, and just literally walk away with the bike out the front of the shop. Um, and the other time I'm recalling now is is that literally I had like one shop I worked at, we we were broken into twice in the middle of the night, just like backdoor style and bikes were taken and those things never got recovered. Um, yeah, those things never got recovered. Um, but uh, yeah, and the one time I was able to recover that bike, it was just kind of from the start, it was just a bonehead mood, move on our shop's part, just kind of leaving it out there and not actively monitoring it um, or surveying it. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel like it's always, well, not always, but I feel like it's really common for it to be like, like I think you mentioned a crime of, of opportunity, I guess, like, you know, you'll leave your bike unlocked for what th you think is like, oh, yeah, I'm just gonna run into the store or something. Yeah. And it's that like moment where, you know, it's open to just, you know, getting stolen that that happens. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll say to that just recently, just right on Friday, I was at the supermarket by my house and this person just, uh, I was leaving right as I, I left the store and right out front, the side, out front of the, right out front of the store um, was a full on titanium Dura Ace, like 11 speed Brooks saddle, just like just minty crazy look. bike. Yeah. yeah, just a crazy, like, you know, easy, just like easy $2,000, just like sitting right there, like lights still on, like, you know, didn't even bother to turn off the lights. And the thing was just like kickstand, you know, I had a, you know, I had a kickstand on it, but um, it just like kickstand was up. And I was just kind of waiting there and I was just like dumbfounded. I was like, what, 
I would like, who is, who is doing this? You're just like really asking for it. And, um, and even for like a non bike nerd, I feel like that kind of stuff stands out. Like, yeah. you know, I'm thinking about someone who might not like place like all these like crazy components you mentioned, like, I feel like a lot of it still, it's like super shiny and like nice. And mm -hmm. I'm just trying to picture that bike. And I can imagine that it's been like really well taken care of, or it's it like, was, yeah. it belongs to someone that's like, you know, like a bike nerd. And I feel like those kinds of bikes stand out quite a yeah. bit, you know? It, I mean, especially in this particular neighborhood, uh, the bike absolutely sta like stood, stands out. Um, and uh, I was, yeah, like I said, I was just dumbfounded, but I ended up, I, I literally, I, I knew what the, I like, I kind of like played a little, I just like got into the psychology of the person that was in the store. And I was just like, I know this fool is just thinking they're going to be in there for two seconds and they're going to come right back out. But that's all it takes just to like, in this case, have someone just sit on the dang thing and ride away with it. So I got out and I just kind of, you know, I just waited. I just waited with, you know, guard. <laughs> yeah, I, I went and like, you know, I wasn't puppy guarding or anything, but I was just like, I was thinking of, I own personally two, two of my bikes are titanium bikes. And I, first of all, would never, ever lock those bikes up anywhere. Let like have that, like anytime they're in public, like I'm sitting on them. Um, but to think about like this, this tie bike with, especially it's set up, just kind of sitting outside the store in this like neighborhood, just like you are just asking for trouble, my friend. So, yeah. Um, so then the question of the hour. So yeah. what happens to stolen bikes? Um, and, and, you know, going along with that, like, where can people look to find those bikes? You know, yeah. if I get my bike stolen tomorrow, fingers crossed I don't, um, mm -hmm. you know, what can I do? Where can I go to try and find it? Yeah, so this is a super kind of mixed bag of answers. And I will say, frankly, in my experience in the industry, like, it's, there isn't like, there isn't a lot of solace, I think, in maybe what it is I'm about to explain because the recovery rate in my experience is, is low. Um, and that's not to say it's impossible, but every time I hear about an individual or someone close to me in my community getting a bike stolen and getting it recovered, I'm, I'm kind of shocked. I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> um, that being said, um, you know, what happens to bikes after they get they get scooped up is, is anyone's guess because it's, it's all contingent upon what the intention of the theft is, right? It's like, is this a, a crime of opportunity where like, again, in the case of like maybe my last anecdote where someone was caught sleeping and someone just rode off on that bike and now you, they just have that bike and maybe it just sits in their backyard and they just kind of ride around on it for a while and they really didn't have any intent on like flipping it or scrapping it. It's just like, hey, I just got a bike now. Like I didn't have a bike, now I got a bike, this is cool. Um, or they're looking at the bike as a potential flip as like a sale, in which case, you know, monitoring, you know, uh, resale sites such as um, Craigslist or OfferUp um, or um, even Pinkbike, I'd say is a good place or even our Facebook marketplace is a good place to, to see if anything pops up and you're just like monitoring. Um, or the other part is that, you know, someone saw your bike and I, and was I able to identify a select portion of that bike that they're interested in, in which case they will just be taking your bike, stripping the things off of it that they want, and then just literally just discarding the rest. Um, that's maybe the most heartbreaking of situations because it, it like kind of reminds me of like the shark fin soup type of like industry where, you know, people are just catching sharks and like cutting fins and like saving the fins and just like ditching the bodies. Like that's just like wasteful and just awful and so many levels. But in the case of like a bike, it's also just like, man, you know, someone maybe didn't even understand, like they had a, a set of components or a thing on their bike that potentially could fetch X amount of dollars. And then someone and, and you as the user, it's just like, it's like, it doesn't matter what that dollar amount is to you, but all of a sudden somebody else sees that and they immediately just see like, you know, 150 to $300 just like sitting there. It's just like, all right, I'll just take it. Yeah, uh, I remember uh, one of our staff members, they got a bunch of bikes stolen and that was the first thing that we all did was we, or at least I did, like I went almost like a whole week, like every day I just had a Craigslist, like yeah. bikes open just looking to see if maybe I could identify even a part of it. Um, 
something that I, I've seen that's pretty common too. And that's not to say that every bike that's spray painted is stolen, yeah. but that, I, I've noticed that a lot too. I remember like working at your shop and that would happen all the time. You know, you'd see like bikes with spray paint. Sometimes it's just customization. Other times, you know, I've noticed people walking around with bikes and like, you know, it's like, man, like something is very clearly wrong and it's yeah. like just totally spray painted to try and like mask, like, yeah. you know, this like I, stolen bike. Yeah, this the spray paint aesthetic is is a good one, but then also the tape aesthetic where it's just like someone just didn't even have paint. They just have duct tape and it's just like tape the tubing. I've, just, seen, like, tape it up. <laughs> I've seen like blue scotch tape as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, that's a really common one. I see that all over the place, like tape all over the thing. Um, yeah. That's interesting. Um, cool. So then, I mean, we kind of went over it, but what can people do to prevent their bike from being stolen? I would say like registration and locking, but what else do you recommend? Yeah. So registration and locking is just the, the best place you can start. Um, I would say being able to identify, I think there's a hierarchy of things that you should understand as a bike owner when you lock it outside that you don't want to lose. Right. And I would say the whole bike is at the top. You lose the whole bike year. <laughs> yeah. That's just a bummer. Like <laughs> you're getting a new bike at that point. Um, yeah, yeah. And then I would say beyond that, um, you know, the, the theft of, you know, somehow if, if someone was able to, to scoop on the, on the frame without the wheels, like that, that would be like a big bummer. Um, but then the next one would be if you just lose the rear wheel, like that's a, that's some money right there immediately. Um, and then the next thing that people lose what I what most commonly would be the front wheel. So that's not to say that people don't lose cockpits like handlebar setups or saddles and seat posts and things. Um, but typically the, the, the thing that, uh, that elicits the, the thief of opportunity is the quick release. And so understanding when you, when you lock up your bike that has quick release on the seat post or on the wheels, um, that you should really be considerate of, of using a U-lock with some sort of like tethered lasso um, to lock this stuff up, I, you know, to, to like go around the, to go through the wheels and the frame, um, and then even like you lock the frame to a secure space. Um, that being said, you know, your, I think the effort of my, my education or my piece of advice to people is just like, when you're locking up your bike, really you're looking at your locking up kind of ritual as more of a deterrent because I have never seen a foolproof bike, you know, system. Um, that being said, I also wouldn't necessarily recommend riding and parking things like outside bars or like clubs or, you know, whatnot that you would also be bummed about if you lost. Um, I think that's been one of my biggest deterrents is just like the bike I ride to like commute, like just in my little town, um, you know, it's something that if I got nicked, I'd be bummed about, but it wouldn't just be like this soul crushing, like defeat. Um, San Diego is a bit different because, you know, when I lived in San Diego, like I had to ride far distances on a pretty, you know, equipped bike that I would then be locking up. And when I would do that, I would oftentimes ride with a satchel or a bag to contain a lasso and or a U-lock to kind of contain everything together. Um, the other thing, and I know me and Oliver, we had talked about it was, you know, the, the ability, there's that company that you, you can swap out, uh, quick releases for secure locking devices, um, on the wheels, the seat post and the stem. Can you mention that one more time? Yeah, that's uh, pinhead locks. Um, so pinhead, um, is, you know, one of these companies that, um, they sell, like you mentioned, quick releases, um, but they also sell a bunch of different, um, you know, components where you can actually lock up like your stem, um, your wheels, your seat. Um, and it's basically just trying to get everything locked onto your bike. I know there's a lot of different like uh, companies out there and, you know, I invite everyone to do research on that type of product. I know Pinhead isn't the only one, but at least personally, I've seen Pinhead probably the most working in shops, um, working at your shop too. I remember, uh, yeah. yeah, actually specifically, Mm -hmm. uh, the silver end to the quick release skewer. And um, customers would never have that key. They would they never, never have it. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's uh, the downside of these devices, I'd say. Yeah. But I will say, if you do, if you're responsible, you'll buy pin headlocks, uh, and if you want to be your mechanics friend, you'll keep the yeah. key, um, and that'll make getting it off so much easier. But they're great because you know, even for a mechanic, uh, I remember working on a bunch of bikes like that and being like, oh man, how am I going to get this thing off? So if it's challenging me. It's going to be challenging yeah. for someone, you know, that's walking by like, ooh, how do I steal those wheels? Yeah. And that's, that's uh, the opportunity part. It's just like, you know, people are getting bikes ripped off that are typically just kind of sleeping on, you know, watching their bike. Um, and if it's just like, even if you just have like an odd sized, you know, in this case with Pinhead, it's just like they have these odd sized Allen keys um, or kind of locking mechanisms that are not, you know, they're not impossible to figure out, but it's going to take someone unacquainted with that system more than two to three minutes to figure out, in which case they're just going to want to move on and just be like, oh, there's an, a quick release wheel um, on a frame. The frame's locked, but neither of the wheels are locked. Like, you know, undo the quick release and just gank that stuff out. It's, it's really not hard to do. Well, I think, too, like, it, it brings up this, like, point about, like, you know, at the end of the day, I, I feel like partially the reason why I would invest into stuff like that or into a good lock isn't necessarily because like, oh, I think the lock is going to keep someone from grinding it off. I've spent like $100 or something on this, on this lock, but rather like how do I increase the level of difficulty for someone to like mm -hmm. just take my bike in a few like minutes because yeah. ultimately like that's probably the most important part. I've, I've you know, at previous employers, I remember like riding my bike there and being like, I'm bringing this inside. Yeah. Like, and so I think that's another interesting shout out is like maybe pressure is like if you're riding your bike to work, once things go back to normal, like pressure them, you know, like, hey, yeah. I want to bring this into my office because like that stuff I think is really important. Like how long you have it outside, yeah. parked, how long it's unattended, you're just like increasing that sort of danger people are taking notes people are walking by and people are taking notes and you know if you're on a routine and someone likes your routine because they're seeing what what you have that as they what they want you know your bike becomes a target and i think that's also like you bring up a really good point oliver about you know i think there's this cultural piece that is to always think like to those who maybe aren't terribly bike savvy to 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 think about bikes as things that only live in garages and in backyards or side yards, um, not an, in interior space because these are outdoor things. And while there is truth to that, I think there is a case as as people become more bike aware and more people become uh, bike commuters is just like people should be you know advocating for their bike safety, which means you know bringing it into the office, especially if it's not um, obtrusive or in the way or excessively dirty or anything like that. So, um, you know, that has always been my, and that's, you know, with, you know, with you guys in the shop, you know, when I, you know, when you guys roll in, it's just like, keep that stuff in, in the shop. Like you guys, yeah, you could walk it outside, but um, I always enjoyed being able to provide that level of security to you guys to be able to just kind of roll in and just hang up your bikes out of sight in, in the, in the shop and then kind of get to work. Especially, especially with like bike nerds or bike mechanics, I feel like that's a big, that's yeah. a big thing. Or even like an avid cyclist who maybe isn't a bike nerd but yeah. has a crazy bike or has mm -hmm. a crazy brand new e-bike. Like people might want to rip it off, and so yeah. the less time that you can spend in a place where you're not leaving that, I think, is super, super valuable. Yeah, kind of a digressive point, but in the same vein, it's like. All these cities are developing, Santa Barbara included, are developing bike share systems. And those systems are not foolproof either. Like as much GPS tracking or as much like utility and or locking devices that they've proprietarily developed or worked with a company to keep these things secure, um, those bikes are getting ripped off too. Not in like mass quantity, um, but you know, these things, these things go missing as well. Like those, those bikes are targets. And I mean, limes, I'd, I'd lump like lime scooters and bird scooters um, into that um, kind of, yeah, category as well. Yeah, um, there's a plane passing over me, but hopefully okay. you can hear me. Um, yeah, I've, the amount of bikes that I've seen in downtown San Diego that are very clearly of a bike share, yeah. that have <laughs> like had the lock. So like there's one that it's a, like a lock that's on the bike, it's integrated. 
and it locks the back wheel. I've mm -hmm. seen so many of those with the lock just chopped off and yeah. someone's walking around with it and they've like repainted it. Um, so yeah, even those are like very easy targets, especially because they're just sitting there kind of yeah. unattended for days on end. So yeah, and they're meant to be like, quote unquote, these like utility bikes that are like foolproof in their utility, but then also in security. But, you know, there's, you know, a desperate person's a desperate person or, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, whatever. It's just like, they're going to get what they want if it's available and just kind of roll the dice on it. What I think that's important too, to mention is that like, sometimes, you know, there's, I, I feel like there's a lot of different types of people. Oh my God. Who are, uh, <laughs> Who are stealing bikes you know yeah. like there's yeah. there's people who maybe like just like you said just want a one component and then there's yeah. other folks who we mentioned it before the stream like maybe they're just trying to get by and like you know trying to feed their family i'm not saying that it's the right thing to do yeah. but i think that's something to really keep in mind too because i see that a lot online where people are like let's go like confront this person and mm. like you know once you like realize you're like oh man like this isn't someone like just you know uh the you know the dark market i'm gonna sell your yeah. bike like it's someone yeah. it's a real person with like mm -hmm. really serious like financial issues you know yeah and i and i think to that point to think about the stratification of who is a bike thief just varies um it's not one person or demographic by any means um and that is just you know also a piece of this consideration about like what happens if you actually do locate your bike like what happens when you actually locate your bike and you feel like you you're like you're you you know where your bike is you potentially know the person who has it like what are you gonna do um and i personally i don't know if i could actively say that i would be encouraging of anyone to be physically confrontational that being said you know th there are you know, in, in, in the one case that I can recall, the Santa Barbara Police Department was receptive to helping out a young woman to kind of shadowing her as she rolled up and, you know, kind of talked to someone about having her bike and she was able to get it back. But in that, you know, in that particular case, you know, it was just kind of this like home bum situation and she saw her bike and she was just like, oh my goodness, like, I got to, you know, she camped out there, was just kind of surveying the scene and the police showed up and she was able to get it worked out. But, you know, as a, her, as like a young woman walking into this kind of like situation, you know, that was, you know, I wouldn't suggest, you know, active confrontation in, in that, nor did she necessarily feel comfortable um, being actively confronting that person who potentially had her bike in their situation. Uh, yeah. I mean, I know I wouldn't like, I, you never know, like, who took your bike, you know, like we mentioned earlier, like maybe it's someone on hard times. Yeah. Maybe it's someone that's like, you know, not the like greatest person. And like, you're walking yeah. into like a really crazy scenario. So yeah. like I strongly discourage, and so does the coalition, yeah. like trying to confront people like, you know, on your own, you know, talk to authorities, figure out a way that you can resolve that sort of issue in a way that isn't putting you at danger or putting someone else in danger, you know? I, I would 100% agree with that. And for all these reasons, especially this one, I like to say, and I truly believe this, that bicycle sales, like used bicycle sales is the perfect gray market. Meaning it's just like everything you see that's used isn't necessarily like on the level, nor is it like an indictment of a crime. There's it's so hard to ever prove beyond a shadow of a doubt with all the variables that we're talking about that it's just like someone is like criminally liable um, within your particular situation. And it's just like, even beyond this like one-to-one -one peer exchange of, you know, identifying and getting your bike back, it's just like, there's also this whole legal recourse that you could also like get yourself wrapped up into. And again, it's just like, is that worth your time? Is it worth, you know, taking money to, to exercise? Like, these are all things to, to, I guess, just weigh, but it all depends. Again, it's just like I said, it's just like, some of us have romantic relationships with our bicycles. And it's, you know, to, to some lengths, so it's, you know, it's worth it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think it, I, I mean, I know, for myself, personally, I would lose my mind if I had a bike stolen. Um, but, you know, the first thing that I would try and figure out is, you know, where it's at, what's happened to it. And 
what I can do to resolve the issue in a way that doesn't put me in danger. You know, yeah. I never want to be in that yeah. position of like, yeah, let's roll up to this person's house. Like that's, that's so. Uh, it's not, it's not worth your body. It's not worth your safety. It's not worth a friend's body or their safety by any means. It's an inanimate object at the end of the day. Yeah. Very, well, just confrontation in general, I feel like is not the way to resolve something like that. So. Cool. Um, I think that's all the questions that I have. Um, do you have anything that you would like to plug, like the AS Bike Shop or yourself? <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess I'll start with my shop's uh, website, just the AS Bike Shop. You can kind of come and see what it is that we're doing, especially in a remote capacity, um, and read about our services. Um, the, currently, the shop is also building a brand new building on the UCSB campus with construction um, expected to take place uh, this summer, late summer, early fall, and we are very excited about it. It's, I think, the second oldest bike shop in Santa Barbara, founded in 1974. So we've come a long way, and this is the first time we are ever going to have like a permanent location. So check out our website. Um, the yeah, totally grad. Uh, the next thing I'll say is I'll just plug my uh, my website for um, my art, which is just um, ADM. Uh, Yonke, J -A -H -N -K -E .com. Um, and you can see some of my work there. Um, some of my work is explicitly bicycle related. Um, the work that you're actually looking at right here was made in Chula Vista at the Glenner Alzheimer's Foundation um, for patients suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, you can check out that work and some of the other work that I do and some of the work that my students have made while I've been teaching. So um, yeah, that's all I have to really plug for myself and for the work that it is I do. Awesome. Um, and I, it looks like 